Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. It's interesting. Like, you know, I was thinking California is the one place I could go where I could kind of dress any way I want. Because, you know, you see the CEOs, these multi-hundred million dollar companies that come out, like the whole look would like, like, you know, you could run into them at Starbucks, you wouldn't recognize them. But, they, but, then, but then I thought, why did I pick this suit? Of all things, it's almost like I'm conspicuously out of uh, vogue. And then I, I, and I, I couldn't understand it until this morning. I'm looking at my clothes and going, that's what I brought and the Lord said, you're not going to church, you're going to the embassy. This is what I wear when I meet presidents and ambassadors. This is the outfit. It's like Disney. I tell all my students, there's always an attire that goes with the, uh, you know, the sphere. If you're the New York Yankees, you wear that. But if you're wearing the New York Yankees outfit to school, it looks kind of out of place. This is the costume I wear when I meet with ambassadors. And the Lord said, I'm to talk to you as though you are ambassadors. And some of you don't even know that you're called to be ambassadors. You're coming here because someone invited you here today. Well, we're glad you're here. But the truth is, God knew you were going to be here. And, uh, and my mission, I believe, is to share with you the face of the future. I study uh, an interesting group of, oh, you know what? I got products on the table. I do a terrible job. I discovered a pile of products on a table out there, and I said, you know why I have a pile of products? Because in not one meeting have I mentioned I have anything in the lobby. So <laughs> let me focus for a second on this. was a visual reminder. I've got Doing Business Supernaturally. Now, this is a wild series because in it, I discuss the supernatural gifts of the Spirit that operate in the natural realm of business. So, for instance, I'll give you an example, something I said during the business conference. When I got involved with um, Donald Trump and the election process, I actually only went up to that meeting um, because somebody put me on a list to meet with Donald Trump after they attended a meeting I did like in a garage in Florida teaching friends of mine seven mountains and seven spheres of influence. And the guy who was tasked with putting the most important people in the room with Trump when he was just beginning his integration into politics, they put me on the list. And I didn't think I belonged in the room because I saw everyone there as well known. I'm kind of like ninja-like. I stay, in the, I stay off the uh, headlines. And I went up to the elevator guy. I said, is my name actually on that list? And the guy goes, yeah, you're on the list. I go, how come? He goes, because I put you on the list. I said, who are you? He said, I was in a meeting you did in a garage down in Florida, and God told me then I'm supposed to get you in front of Donald Trump. So here's something you want to catch. When God wants to put you into the future, he creates divine appointments in the most unlikely places that aren't all about the event you're at. It's about the connection you form at the event you're at for the future he's about to open up. So I go in. Now, I'm in there, and uh, I don't know what I'm doing there. And, and I'm with a group of these senior pastors, ministry leaders, mega church pastors, and TV, TV network owners. And uh, the only thing I know is I talked to a guy who is like an economist, and he says, uh, there's 30 million small businesses in the United States. One third of them are owned by people of faith. That's 10 million small businesses owned by people of faith that have family values. Now, those entrepreneurs are basically their Protestant-type people that want to have independence from the corporation and the system so they can express their own gifting. How many people in the room right here are independent business owners? You have your own business, you're self-employed. All right, there you go, our demographic. So, out of 30 million small businesses, 10 million of them are faith businesses. Most people don't know it. The average company has at least a bookkeeper, a wife, uh, and one or two. And as it grows, it has anywhere from three to five people. That's 30 to 50 million people that are in the orbit of influence and power with small businesses that drive 70% of the economics of the nation. They're 70% of the employers. It's not the big, the big box stores that make all the money 
during a COVID plague. They shut you down, and the money goes to these big box stores in Wall Street because the fat cats make the money, but you guys actually generate the jobs. 70% of the employment comes through the small business owner. So anyway, that's all I got in my mind. I used to pastor. I pastored for 20 years, but uh, but I, once I got involved with the seven spheres of influence, I became obsessed with how do we go into there to impact that. So anyway, pastors are talking, the network leaders are talking about, well, you know, it's weird. Like they're talking about basically two issues are social issues that all Christians obsess about, and it's just gotten worse in both areas. It's either going to be abortion or gays. Gays or abortion. So they're talking about that, and I'm thinking, poor Donald Trump, this, this is his vision. He's getting talked to by the spiritual leaders of the country. And all they could do is pick on two certain social things that bother Christians. They don't have a vision for the economic vitality of America. They don't have a vision for the, the, uh, the standing of the United States in the world. I'm thinking, oh, interesting study this is. And then the guy who invited me kicks my chair. He says, I put you in the room to say something. What am I? So I, I'm, not, I'm not in that chorus of all these social ill complaints. All that I'm thinking, there's 30 million small businesses in the United States. That's all I'm thinking in my head. It's like, it doesn't even fit. So uh, Donald Trump goes, what's happened with Christianity in the country anyway? He goes, he goes look, Bill Maher, regularly, these guys, they make fun of Christians. They, they lampoon Christianity. You know, I grew up in the old Billy Graham era. It wasn't like that when I grew up. I mean, if you don't mind me saying so, in my opinion, this is classic Trump. This is when I fell in love with him. In my opinion, you guys have all gotten soft. And then he realized he had insulted a whole room of ministers. And he was trying to convince them he's a Christian. He didn't know what a Christian was back then. So he goes, I, when I say you, I mean me and we. I mean, uh, we, we've gotten soft, haven't we? Me too. And it's like, and I'm laughing. And so oh, I get kicked in the chair again. And I go, oh, man, the guy that invited me wants me to speak. And I go, yeah. And everybody stared at me like, what? <clears throat> then I had the like, Seinfeld moment hits me. And there's 30 million small businesses in the United States, and one-third of them are owned by Christians, and the average one has three to five employees, there's 30 to 50 million people that would be voting if people would be understanding that you're a man who has an entrepreneurial vision for America that supports Christian values. There's a whole unleashed coalition that needs to be raised up. And Trump's like staring with his upper lip sticking out, like down the table staring at me across his apprentice table. And I'm, I'm realizing he's not going to do that strategy. He's going to go for the Rust Belt. He's going to go for the Democrats. He's going to go for manufacturing. This is a great idea, but it's a weird thing for a guy to be saying in the middle of a room. Well, when it's over, I felt so dumb because, thank you. It's like a weird comment out of left field. A good comment, by the way. A brilliant comment, if I don't mind saying so. But uh, not fitting, but I had to say something because I didn't want to get kicked in the chair again. So when it was done, I said, oh, God, what am I doing here? What the heck am I? That's embarrassing. What am I? I don't even fit around with Donald Trump, with The Apprentice, with economics, with race issues, and with homosexuality. I, I'm the Seven Mountain guy. I, this, I don't do this. And here's what the Lord says to me. Every time you pray in tongues, you tell me this is what you want to do. I am a Pentecostal. I actually believe in the supernatural gifts of the Spirit. I believe in prophecy, gifts of faith. I give the gifts of healing. I have seen God lead me by gifts of the Spirit and open doors and do things that are supernatural. I'm also kind of like an academic, an academician. I got my doctorate, and I, and, I, and I work in business. So I can, I have different, you know, ways I can chameleon-like, you know, adapt to different environments. But the reality is, at that moment, I had the most unusual experience because as a Christian, I know that I'm supposed to be filled with the Spirit. If you're filled with the Spirit, you can have a prayer language. If you have a prayer language, to me, it's the greatest secret weapon you've got that if you don't have it, you need to get it. Because when you pray in an unknown tongue, the Bible says, you edify yourself. The Greek word edify means to build an edifice. You're building an edifice on the inside of you to house a revelation that God is giving you that gives you a unique perspective 
for what you're doing. Every one of you needs to have a unique perspective for your own life and your own destiny. Building an edifice on the inside to house a missing piece. The piece that you're missing will come to you because you authorize it when you pray. I was praying myself out of the religion box into media. I now got 20 million downloads on my own podcast. It's only two and a half years old. And I, and I do it without advertising. I do it basically by just doing it. And I'm going to tell you something. The gifts of the Spirit are about to be released in a greater measure upon you that are in this room who are willing to give God what he wants with the favor and the anointing that he gives to you. He wants his church to go into the world system and shake it up. Doing business supernaturally explains that. I have to work that into my message now. Oh, and the rest of these things I won't talk about. They're out on the table. Just go get them. They're all good. This is a coaching series I do. I got a group of people that I help to coach or talk to or advise. The net worth of the average person in the room has to be $25 million for them to be in the room. It's really weird because I don't have $25 million, but I'm the guy teaching them because I am a rabbi. And so the rabbi is the one who instructs. And what's interesting about being a rabbi is that um, you yourself aren't allowed to go own the real estate in the Bible, but you could train everybody else in how to acquire wealth. Because our real estate in the ministry that we've got is revelation knowledge. So I work with a currency which is, a, a, which is, a, which is heaven's currency. It's the currency of revelation. And my job is to break it up and give it to you so that you turn it into the currency of acquisition. And you acquire influence and power. So I have the uh, wealth of revelation. You have the wealth of application. And therefore, like I imagine this, my, my room is filled with students that are 25 million bottom. That's in order to get in the room up to a billion dollars. I've got a hundred of them that I'm training. So you want to get what I'm teaching? You can get it for like, you know, buck 95 or something. Go grab it on the table. Those guys have to earn 25 million to get it. You can get it on the table. So, so here's where I want to go. I want to start with... Uh, Tying this into what I was talking about earlier today, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. If you got your Bible, I recommend you guys start using Bibles. Let me tell you something. If you have a digital apparatus in your hand, the danger of a digital Bible is that you can check texts and emails and messages. Why would you lead yourself into temptation? I'm serious. I, I, I don't have the ability to have my phone with me in a meeting without at a low point or a certain point of multitasking, I feel like just checking on something. And the very moment, I guarantee, the moment that you check, you think that doesn't affect you, but it does. I only bring a book and I bring a pen because here's what I want to do. I want to underline or circle anything that hits me during the meeting because over the course of 20 or 30 years, the underlines became the things the Spirit of God was telling me. And then as I read the Bible, I go back to the underlined part that he spoke to me before, and it highlights itself, and he gives me another layer, and another layer, and another layer. And before you know it, it's like a code book, so I'm going to give you the code. In the last days, according to the, uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 12, we are entering a period of unprecedented shaking. This is kind of important that you get this because you're going to experience, you're going to pray for peace, peace, peace. I'm going to suggest that maybe you don't want to be praying for peace. What you want to pray for is an insight into what God's doing in the chaos. Because if you're living in a period where God is shaking everything, praying for things to stop shaking may not be the prayer that get answered. But praying that you could be unshakable during the midst of shaking may be something God is going to move on. So watch this. It says this. It says... Um, now this yet, uh, yeah, yeah, verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, verse 26 of chapter 12 of Hebrews. But now he has promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. What in the world are we looking at? We're looking at God saying he's going to shake heavens and the earth. Then he's saying, I promise I'm going to do it. Now, a promise 
is not a threat. We look at the last days with an ominous anxiety about those things that are coming upon the earth because we know that there are troubling times coming upon the earth. Then we build, then we have to, we're, we're backed into, and this is where your church is, that's why I want to talk to you about it, a very weird juxtaposition. How are you to see the last days? Because it is typical for Christians that do not understand their assignment to look at getting out of here as their priority. I'm out of here. I hear preachers in Dallas and it drives me crazy because they're famous with their eschatology. The only vision they have is the Antichrist is coming, the Great Tribulation, and you better be ready because the rapture is going to happen any minute. What does it tell Christians? Loosen up, back up, bite your nails, and hope you're ready for the rapture roof to roll back because any minute you're out of here. Well, how does that jive with a church that's called to awaken a nation and occupy spheres? How does that fit? Where... Tell me this doesn't produce a kind of end-time eschatological schizophrenia. When, you, when you're detaching yourself because you have no ambition or vision or faith for your nation, you're just watching the toboggan going down, and any day now we're going to be out of here. So you become selfishly, rather, strangely, absorbed with your own survival. We become the prepper people. Well, you never know when Jesus is coming back. So I've got all my waters. I've got my underground this. I've got my this. I've got my Patriot bubble. And you got, I sell this stuff. I all, I'm like the prepper paradise promoter. So one day I realized, you know what? You're supposed to occupy till he comes, not hide out till he gets here. <laughs> occupy till he comes. Well, oh, oh, that sounds like a, what did he just say? Occupy till he comes, Jesus said. Not be preoccupied with when you're getting out. Now, I'm convinced that the reason why the shaking is a promise is because, in a way, God is shaking things up so the things that were harder to do will be easier to do because when everything gets shaken, that which cannot be shaken is given an advantage. So if you're building your house on a rock in an earthquake, a lot of real estate is going to be for sale shortly. It's a tragic scenario whenever all the houses go down. But on the other hand, the person who's built his financial life on a rock, who's built his marriage on a rock, who's built his diet, you, when everything else gets shaken and the, and the foundation of what they built on is exposed and it doesn't work, you, it may, it may, it may, be, it may be distressing because you're subject to this storm, but your boat will float because you built it on the unshakable kingdom. This scripture says, I promise you, I'm going to shake everything so that everything that's been made can be tested. And that which passed the test will be revealed to be unshakable. It will be built on my word, on my spirit, on my will, with my presence and my people. And that unshakable kingdom is going to be promoted as a result of everything that is made that is in rebellion to me is going to have to come down. Does that make sense to you? All right, so now, just catch the tension of this. If what I'm saying is, and I'm just reading the Bible, the removal of those things that are being shaken as the things that are made. Now, if you want to go into the advanced class on this, the Bible says in Colossians that everything that is made, both visible and invisible, was made by him. Thrones, visible and invisible. That tells me that he's, Paul is saying that you see the Roman emperor there? There's a spirit realm above him. Satan has his invisible hierarchy. Human beings have their visible hierarchy. You want to know what's going on in earth? It's the history is the outplaying of the angelic and the principalities in war and the praying life of the church. And what you're seeing is history expressing itself down here as the manifestation of the invisible war of thrones. That's the real game of thrones in the heavenlies. When you have a prophet like Daniel, he reaches up into the spirit, praying for his people, Israel, and God shows him. He is dealing with the prince of Persia, which is over modern-day Iran. And then he shows him that I am going to bind that spirit and move it out of the way. Then the prince of Greece will come, which will be Alexander the Great. This is why the Bible is so powerful. It prophesies with accuracy.
accuracy hundreds and thousands of years into the future, and history verifies what the prophet said. Daniel saw Greece will come after, after Iran, after Persia. And then the next generation after that. So Daniel saw successive generations all the way down to the very last one, which is ours. The prophet could see that way. And the battle in the spirit realm will be fought out in the natural realm here. And God is saying, I think I'm going to shake up the heavenly realm too. Oh, now look at what it says. I promise I'm not only going to shake the earth, but also the heaven. Here's a logical question. If we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken here, well, then what heaven is getting shaken? Well, evidently, there's another realm. This is going a little bit deeper into the theological zone here. But Ephesians chapter 6 says, We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers of spiritual wickedness in... Oh, heavenly places. Catch this. I'm going to shake the heavens. This realm here, which is what we'll call third heaven, the heaven of heavens. There's only three heavens in the Bible. Apostle Paul was out of his body, caught up to third heaven. If there's a third, logically, there's a second and a first. Third heaven is a heaven that cannot be shaken. Because there is a heaven that cannot be shaken. Which one is it? Probably the third. The second heaven down here. Oh, that certainly fits. You are at war with principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world. Spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. So this realm here is obviously a realm that's going to be shaken. And then the Bible says I'm going to shake heaven and earth. And in this atmospheric realm, we have the first heaven around the earth. So now let's take a look at the picture here. What's happening, people? Jesus. When we say Jesus is coming, we think of Jesus is coming like, well, you know, the Bible says Jesus is coming like he's way out there. And then at the last minute, boop, he's going to come over here and rescue you. I would suggest to you that there's a slightly different uh, description in the Bible. If you go to Luke chapter 21, go to Luke chapter 21, Jesus describes the last days. He says, now when the shaking happens, don't get shook up. Because I'm doing some things that are actually important to get accomplished. And I don't want you to uh, be disturbed by misunderstanding what I'm up to. So, so Luke chapter 21, check this out. Verse 28. Now Jesus says, when these things Begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. You would think that as many preachers as pour over these verses, there'd be nothing new that could be possibly unearthed. I seriously think, I mean, I've been 40 years listening to people preach this stuff. And I'm thinking one day the Holy Ghost goes, draws nigh, look it up. I thought it draws nigh like on the calendar. It's getting closer. The Lord's, it's the Lord's coming back any day now. Yay, any day now. It's coming back, coming back, coming back. Classicus, watch this. The word for draws nigh, that Jesus says, look up. You're down here. Oh, my gosh, everything's shaking. Look up. Look up when it begins to happen right now as it's starting. Look up. Keep your eye focused there. Why? Because Jesus says, Look up, because the kingdom of heaven draws nigh. I look up the word draws nigh. The Greek word refers to Jesus physically coming near in proximity. It's not the calendar appointment that the end time is coming and Jesus is going to return. It's that he is actually physically getting closer every day. So what's happening is he is physically, geographically coming back. The kingdom of heaven is squeezing like an anaconda the power of Satan and pushing him out of his heavenly place. So now you see Jesus look up. The king of draws nigh. I challenge you, look it up. It means both in terms of schedule and physical proximity. And Jesus drew nigh under the gate of Bethany. Or Jesus drew nigh under the, what curious use of it is a child who is, on a, um, who is in a coffin. 
and they were coming out with the funeral, and Jesus drew near with his group, and they intercepted each other, and Jesus messed up every funeral he ever attended, including his own. And so he shows up, and he touches the, uh, the funeral, the bear, the, and the kid pops up, and every, now the whole thing is rejoiced. They all go together for the next party. What I'm saying is he's drawing near. Heaven is coming to a theater near you. So your challenge is this realm is under siege. Because it's under siege, everything connected to Satan's realm is manifesting. That's why Hamas is freaking out and North Korea is going to do this and China. The nations are all going to manifest because all the principality, the invisible thrones are going to manifest through the physical thrones. But then Jesus says this curious thing. Darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness to people. Fake news will have powerful influence, but upon you my light will shine. What that means is that in the contrast of the darkness getting darker, and now you can pray all you want. Oh, God, send stability. I agree. But understand what heaven is doing. So Jesus said, when these things begin to happen, see that you are not alarmed, for these things must take place. Why must they, Lord? Because I'm pushing Satan out of the heavenlies. And if you want to know the truth, one of the worst exegetically analyzed chapters of the whole Bible is Revelation chapter 12. I don't want to go into it. It's the only place where it describes Satan is fighting with Michael and the angels are fighting with Lucifer and there's no more room for them in second heaven. And they're forced out and they have to go to the earth. That's when you have your great tribulation. What's causing the great tribulation? Weirdly enough, the moment that Satan completely loses his position in the heavenlies, it's the darkest day here, but it's the greatest. That's why it says, rejoice! It says but that happens because salvation's coming. In other words, Satan's coming down. So you've got to actually learn to find the empowering meaning in the very worst headlines. Remember this sermon. God promised, not threatened, the last days because Jesus is coming back but he's coming back closer every day. And that means that if you can push through the resistance of your flesh into communion with God, you will have greater revelation, greater anointing, and greater power than you've ever had before because the kingdom of heaven draws nigh. Make sense? So... Now we go to these seven spheres you've got. You've got these seven areas of uh, influence. Very important. We talked about this uh, earlier today. There's a center and a circumference in every sphere. And in every one of these, the center is the place of influence. That's why the Bible refers to world kingdoms as mountains. Because if you were to pull that sphere up, you see that the spheres actually are like um, pyramid structures at the very top you have the most concentrated influence. This is called the high places, which is why in the Bible they always had the idols and the worship and the demons and the sacrifice and the confrontation with the devil in the high places. So in the high places, what the high places do is they end up having a disproportionate power to shape a nation. So here you go from the, cent you, you go from the circumference to the center the more close you are to the place of influence, the closer you are to the top. If you want to know where the gates of hell are located, look for the gates of influence. You want to see a big battle take place? Let a Supreme Court seat be available. Boom, everybody freaks out. Let a presidential election come along. Boom, everybody freaks out. Why? Because that's where you're trading players at the top of the mountains. So the top of the mountain is actually where you belong. How mischievous. When the church over here is so focused on going there that it doesn't realize it's supposed to go into all the world, not exit from it. At the top of these vertical hierarchies of influence, thank God the family and the church can separate itself from the culture and you could always sustain your strength as a people of God by having, by having God's strong this is how the Jewish people, my, in my background, 2% of the population, we've never exceeded 2% of the population. I'm only 25, 20% 20 
Ashkenazi, but the Jewish people have never exceeded more than one and a half or two percent of the American population. But look how the Jewish people, because God's given freedom in America, they've been able to bless America so that from Einstein to Leonard Bernstein to Seinfeld in every mountain, Dershowitz in law, Jewish people have contributed disproportionately to the richness of the Judeo-Christian culture in America. By the way, you could take George Soros and Larry Fink with, uh, and, and say Jewish people could also disproportionately be mischievous. But the fact that I want you to catch is you that are the children of Abraham, that are of Abraham's seed, have the blessing of Abraham. And what does that blessing give you? The supernatural anointing to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. You're supposed to be at the top of the media mountain. You're supposed to be at the top of the business mountain. You're supposed to be at the top of the government mountain. And then as I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, this is a wild message. What are you telling me? Because it looks to me like the darkness is going to get darker. The nations are going to shake. How, how does this work? And then I began to study this thing a little more closely. The kingdom of heaven is drawing nigh. Look up. Focus in on what the Father is doing. Look at what Jesus is doing. Because the ultimate goal that the Lord has is go make disciples of nations. The church gave up on discipling nations. They prefer to go make conversions to Christ. So you will see much effort made on reaching the lost. You'll see very little conscientious effort made at transforming the culture. Because to transform the culture is to disciple the nation. You don't build, listen, I'm an entrepreneur and a businessman. When I did church consulting after I came out of Wall Street, I was understanding, okay, the new business model is you build a bigger church and you multiply your churches. You have more people attending, more square footage, more staff. The metrics for success in the church world are bigger and larger. It's hard to quantify whether or not you're having an impact in the community by measuring cultural transformation because it's too abstract. So the church measures what it can measure. Offerings, nickels and noses. We look at how many people come, how much money was in the offering. And some churches are, you know, cynical. Some churches are beautiful. They have a good motive for it. But they're still measuring how many were there and how was the cash flow. Not unlike a good business enterprise. The problem is you're measuring the wrong data. What you should be looking at is what is our punching impact upon the spiritual atmosphere in which God put us? Because what we found out is if you don't steward these other mountains, you watch what happens when education mountains get taken over by the secular demons that start to turn them Marxist and anti-Christian. Now, you say, well, well, it's the end times. Yeah, but a lot of that is because of us. Harvard originally was not built for Marxism and progressive Christianity and Hamas. It was built for the preparation of Christian preachers. My first organized protest happened at Harvard. I said, shocking. The university that was set apart for the preparation of clergy, here they got a clergy coming back to them. A son of Harvard comes back, and there's a protest organized against me. The witches, atheists, LGBTQ, and Islam all joined together to protest me and my little Seven Mountain Revelation. Because... Soros-funded left-wing media had already gone ahead and poisoned the well, describing me as a dangerous aberration of Christian nationalism who advocated for the burning of witches and the stoning of gays. Well, I get there. First thing I said is, uh, well, for one thing, who else could bring witches and Muslims and gays and atheists together? By the way, they were Jewish atheists. Who can bring the Jewish atheists and the Muslims in unity other than Jesus? Right there is proof that Jesus is unique. The only person can unify everybody. And I went ahead and I did my teaching there, and I went ahead and had, we had our, had our meetings. And when I was done, by the grace of God and the favor of God, everybody, 
except for the Muslims. They boycotted the protest the moment that they found out that the homosexuals were going to be there because it bothered them. So it was a weird thing. They left. The rest of them stayed together. And they all confronted me. But after I got done teaching, I walked out. And the leading witch from Salem, Massachusetts comes up to me. She goes, excuse me, I got to say something. I was told you advocated for the burning of witches. And I feel kind of bad because, well, I put over 2,000 curses on you. I said, really? She said, yeah, I was mobilizing them on Facebook. I have my own, like, you know, witch uh, center right there in the middle of Salem, Massachusetts. But I got to tell you something. You guys are a heck of a lot more fun than the crowd I'm hanging out with. And I'm looking at her, and then the Jewish guy who is leading the atheist who organized the protest, who was the dean of the summer school, comes up to me. He goes, hey, I'm, I'm feeling kind of bad about this. You're not so bad after all. I, I'm the manager of the Harvard Pub. We have our own beer. I'd be honored if you'd come down and be my guest at the Harvard Pub, and I could get to know you a little better. So I told the witch, I said, you want to join us? She said, okay. <laughs> so I'm walking down to the Harvard Pub there, going down. I got the witch. I got... Guy stops, he goes, hey, 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 I got to talk to you. Well, it's like a little Jesus fascinating. I stopped. He said, I was told you hated gay people. Well, I'm a homosexual here from Boston. And I got to tell you, I didn't hear anything about hate from you. And so uh, I just thought I'd tell you that, you know, I misunderstood, you know, because you can't believe everything you read. I go, you know, that's so true. Even me too, I can't believe everything I read. Would you like to join us at the Harvard Pub? Yeah, okay. I got the gays and the witches and the atheists. We all went down. We had a great time at the Harvard Pub. And when it was over, I'll never forget this. I, I was warned by religious leaders, don't go, there's going to be protests against you. Lance, you're a good guy, you know, with your Seven Mountain message and your business background. Why would you want to get involved? Remember Anita Bryant, she got labeled, uh, you know, the orange juice thing, and the gays came out, and they ruined her whole brand. She couldn't even make money with Anita Bryant with a, I don't know, the Tropicana orange drink. You guys way before your time. But anyway, she was... So I'm going, he's an older guy. I go, yeah, I kind of remember that. She was like, when I was a kid, I remember that. So I said, I got to think about this. So I went to the, for the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm getting some advice from the apostles and the bishops that I really don't need to get involved with these political controversies. It'll, it'll hurt my reputation and, and, and tar my brand. You know what the Lord told me? This is the most humbling thing. The Lord said, you're not that well known that you can mess up a brand. Can you imagine that? Only God can tell you something like that, and your, and your self-esteem is still intact. It's like, well, that's a good point. Nobody knows who I am. He goes, look, goes, nobody knows who you are. Let's be honest about it. A few people know you. Most of the time, people don't know who you are. The Lord said, but I want you to go. I said, why? It's humbling, too. Because the ones I told to go aren't doing it. I found that two big ministries were supposed to go, and they bailed out at the last minute because of the negative press. I'll tell you what, it really makes you feel good and find out people don't know who you are and you weren't God's first choice. <laughs> but I went, and here's what the Lord said. The Lord said, missionaries are needed in every sphere. Because the devil has a caricature of what a Christian is. The devil has a caricature of what a believer is, a Pentecostal, an evangelical, a right wing, whatever. The devil has a caricature. And if you don't go in with a scratch and sniff presence where they can get up close to you, hear you, see you, and you can shatter the propaganda, then the propaganda is stronger than your message. That's why missionaries have to go into all the world. You've got to go in. You've got to go in. Then I was trying to be all cute. I said, well, sometimes we have to be ninja-like, you know, covert and overt, like Esther. She was in there, you know, got her promotion right there. The favor of God was on her, promoted her, leaped her from the periphery to the center, from the bottom of the mountain to the top, because the favor of God will give you a power lift. Boom, take you right to the top of that mountain if you walk with God in favor and faithfulness. I said, so Esther was kind of ninja-like, and then suddenly she had to reveal herself. I was telling this to a Taiwanese billionaire Paris Hilton girl who was, by the way, at Carlsbad at a business retreat I did like uh, six months ago here. I was so shocked. I pulled up to the hotel I'm staying at. I'm so dumb. I'm looking at it going, 
this is familiar. I just, I just did an event at that same location like six months ago. So, and this lady I met there from Taiwan came out. And she's got all these hotels. And I said to her, I said, well, she said, you know, we know the Communist Party in China. My father's friends with President Xi. I'm thinking, hmm. Well, you know, we really need to be ninja-like and be able to get into these places because God promotes us like Esther, and then we can have more influence on the inside. She goes, I love this. She goes, no ninja. I go, what? She goes, no ninja. That's weak. I go, I got a beautiful rebuke from this little Taiwan billionaire lady. She said, they respect you more if you own what you believe. She goes, they respect you if you, know, if you believe and you're strong. She goes, because in their heart there's a big hole. They know something's missing. And when they see somebody sneaking around, it doesn't. But when you take a stand and God blesses you, they respect it. So I'm not even talking sweet about being covert and ninja-like. Because for most people, it's just a code word for cowardice. You just got to be intelligent about how you bear your witness. And timing is everything. Joseph, for instance did not reveal his family or his Hebrew identity until he was in proximity to Pharaoh and solved the problem none of the other consultants could solve. Once Joseph answered the problem for the boss that no one else could solve because God gave him the answer by the gifts of the Spirit, then Pharaoh became interested in Joseph and his family. So if you want people to know about your heavenly father first, do something which establishes the credibility of you as a messenger. Then reveal who sent you. Well, I'm out of time now. I'm already a minute over. I'm sorry. I didn't get into all the things. Went. Some point in the future, we'll come back. Because I really want, I want to talk to you about your destiny. You're called in, in the regions that God sends you. You have spiritual authority over the city. That means on a national level, I, I'm looking at the, the education and, and politics. I'm looking at Washington and, and the whole education system. But if I was locally assigned, I'd be looking at the schools and universities, the local media, the business, and I'd be looking for my people to get them to the top. And what I want to do is help you get to the top of your sphere of influence so that you can cooperate with the shaking and take more territory. Fair enough? Bless you. As the pastor comes up, let me just pray for you. Come Father, on. I thank you today for all of those that were called to be here in this auditorium. Some of you may not even know Jesus. I refuse to change my message in order to accommodate the fact that some of you may, this may sound strange to you, because God wanted you here because he's calling you to be an ambassador of the kingdom of God. He has you here. Because if you look back on your past, wherever you're coming from, that is going to be the harvest field God's going to give you. The place that you've been is the place you're called to occupy. And God's going to make you an ambassador to the very people that you have behind you because he has more real estate before you, stuff you've never done. And by the way, for many of you that already think you're in the business mountain, I'll tell you right now, the thing that God does is he moves from mountain to mountain. You do not know where you'll end up. I started off in the church business mountain. Then I took an exit to the church mountain. Then I leaped over here to the media mountain because I'm working so strong with the government mountain. God will move you from mountain to mountain because he has more territory for you than you can possibly imagine. Father, I pray in Jesus' name for the spirit of excellence, the yatir of God to come upon this house, that power to promote May it come upon this company and give them vision for what you're doing in the last days. Vision that will make them stable and unshakable when everything around them is nervous. May they have a smile on their face because they have inside information. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen. For more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel, YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. 
We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.